Hi, good evening, everyone. Welcome. On behalf of National Eczema Association, I'd like to welcome you to this evening's webinar, Beyond Atopic Dermatitis, Other Eczemas. I'm Carrie Gautier, Director of Marketing and Communications. We can see that there are still people logging on, so we're going to give them a minute to join us. While we wait, I want to make sure you know about all of the upcoming activities here at NIA. October is coming. I know it's only July, but it's around the corner and it is Eczema Awareness Month. So put it on your calendars, get ready for some fun activities. We have a bunch of stuff coming your way, including Itching for a Cure, which is our virtual walk. Um, so we will do that throughout the month of October. So if you'd like to join us, keep your eyes out. We'll be sending out invitations before we know it. And of course, save the date, summer 2019. We will be having another Eczema Expo and we will be releasing the dates and location as soon as we have them, but it will definitely be summer. So keep your eyes out for that. And we do have more webinars for the year being scheduled. So watch your emails. All right, I think it looks like we're about ready to start. So for those of you who have just joined us, I'm Carrie Gautier, I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications here at the National Eczema Association. I'd like to welcome you to this evening's webinar, Beyond AD, other webinars, or <laughs> that's what happens when you travel the day before a webinar, other eczemas. And our presenter this evening is Dr. Peter Leo. This webinar is being recorded and it will be shared with all attendees within the week. The National Eczema Association is a national patient oriented organization, which is governed by a board of directors and guided by a scientific advisory committee comprised of physicians, nurses and scientists who volunteer their time and expertise. We work to improve the, light, the health and quality of life of individuals with eczema through research, support, and education. The National Eczema Association would like to thank our sponsor, Conixa, for their generous support that makes this evening's webinar possible. Dr. Peter Leo is a phenomenal supporter of the National Eczema Association. He sits on both of our board of directors as well as our scientific advisory committee. He serves as assistant professor of clinical dermatology and pediatrics at the Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine and is the founding director of the Chicago Integrative Eczema Center, Medical Dermatology Associates of Chicago. Dr. Leo is a fellow of the American Academy of Dermatology and a diplomat of the American Board of Dermatology. He received his medical degree in derm and dermatology training from Harvard Medical School, where he served as chief resident in dermatology. And while at Harvard, he also received formal training in acupuncture. He has received a Leader of Distinction Award, a Presidential Citation from the American Academy of Dermatology, and numerous teaching awards. And of course, most importantly, an award from Nia, because he is truly one of our best champions, and we are so, so lucky to have him. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm very <laughs> proud of my NIA award too. That uh, <laughs> I'm sure you have it proudly displayed. <laughs> I do. You, got, you took the words out of my mouth, my mouth there. Um, so during the, the webinar, uh, welcome everyone. Good evening. Thank you for having me. During the webinar, please ask questions. The, the on the screen right now is how to submit those questions. So we'd love to get questions, and I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, probably at the end of things, Carrie, is that right? We'll sort of wait till. Till the end yeah, of the so for... you can submit questions throughout the webinar. Um, in order to do that, you can see on your, um, if you're on your desktop, on your um, menu to the right, there is a section called questions. You can go ahead and submit right there. We'll get them and we'll be going through them. Um, if you're on your mobile device, you may have to swipe through. And I will say there is both video as well as a slideshow. And so if you're on your mobile device, you can view both of those things, but you have to swipe between the screens to see them. Unfortunately, it doesn't support seeing both at the same time. Um, so we will take a short two minute pause at the end of the presentation where we'll remind you to offer questions at that point in time once you've heard all of the presentation. 
um, at which point we'll go through them and, and ask all the questions that we can. Perfect. So this is a really interesting topic to me. Um, I'm very fascinated in the sort of the other eczemas. These are the ones that are not the classical archetype of atopic dermatitis. These are the things that are uh, cousins of it, related to it in the same family, but they are different in their own way. And each one kind of has its own story. So we're going to kind of go on an adventure together and talk about some of these other winding pathways in dermatology. They are all bound together because they're all eczematous. They have similar features to eczema and of course we know that eczema is such an interesting word it, it, it really comes from the words that mean in Greek the result of boiling over in the ancients they thought that there were bad humors and maybe not only the ancients some people today even talk about these ideas that there's toxins or bad humors boiling out of the skin and that was sort of one of the original conceptions of the disease and so we have things that have this appearance. When we talk about what does an eczema look like clinically, they are they share a few things. First of all, they tend to be itchy. They tend to be erythematous or red, and they have scale and dryness on the surface. Uh, very acute eczemas can actually be blistery and form these little pap we call papulovesicles, little bumps that actually have fluid in them. And some can even be open then and oozing, as we know, uh, with particularly with acute atopic dermatitis. If it gets bad, people have open sores on their skin. Over time, it can become thicker and darker pigmented. We call that process lichenification. It gets that rough, uh, very textured kind of skin. And when we look under the microscope, that's the other way these are all brought together. They look very, very similar. Sometimes patients will say, can we do a test? to see what this is. Um, and one test we can do is, is a biopsy of the skin and look under the microscope, but it's in a weird way. It helps us know what it isn't more than what it is because it kind of puts it in this category, but it's a bit general. We can go to the next slide there. Thank you. These are the um, types, some of the types of other, other eczemas, if you will. Numular eczema, dyshydrotic, seborrheic dermatitis, asteatotic, auto eczematization or an id reaction, pityriasis alba, which is really important, stasis dermatitis, lichen simplex chronicus, paragonodularis, and JPD, or juvenile plantar dermatitis or dermatosis. So we're going to look at some of these and we'll talk a little bit about them in the next, next 45 minutes to an hour. Next slide, please. Let's start with numular eczema or numular dermatitis. This is really interesting. It comes from the Latin word numulus, which means a small coin. And they really do make these little coin-shaped patches we can see in the picture. They're very defined. Um, it is interesting because it can be found in both kids and adults. And sometimes it is found in patients that have a history of atopic dermatitis. So they have more conventional classical atopic derm, and then they'll get these little coin-shaped lesions. It's fascinating because they look so different than regular conventional atopic dermatitis that sometimes you have to entertain other ideas like, is this a fungal infection? Is this a bacterial infection? Is this contact dermatitis? You know, if you're allergic to your watch uh, and you have a ring there or a little, little patch, like a numular patch, you might think that that could be what's driving it. So we have to make sure it's none of those things, but it really is, you can, you can get rid of all those possibilities and exclude them and you still can have this concept. Um, next slide, please, if we could. Uh, it can be seen in these patients with regular atopic derm, but also some patients who never had anything. So that's why part of we think it's it's in the spectrum of, of in one of the eczemas, but it can be with or without it. And sometimes it can be triggered by something. And in fact, in kids in particular, we often see this version as a sign of a trigger. The most common one is a staph infection. And that's interesting. We'll, we'll really, these have a very high percentage of being colonized, heavily colonized with staph. Uh, but things like allergic contact dermatitis or even molluscum, when kids get molluscum contagious, which is kind of like those little water warts, that can trigger this immune response. Next slide, please. Treatment's really tough because in part, I think because it's associated with staph bacteria. And so sometimes people use like a mid or low potency cortisone and it just doesn't budge. They just say it's not, not only is it not helping or it's rebounding, uh, it's just just not touching it. And when we see that, two things we have to think about. The first is we have to say, okay, are we sure this is the diagnosis? Because if it's a fungal infection, for example, ringworm, you don't want to put cortisone on that. That's going to make it worse. Uh, so we have to make sure again. And if it's a bacterial infection, then we don't want to do that either. So sometimes it's truly both. It's a this eczematous reaction plus bacteria. And so oftentimes we'll use a combination of a high potency steroid 
plus uh, an antibacterial, and that usually will do the trick. But again, if we're not sure, we have to explore it. And so it is a little bit one of those, it's one of those interesting situations. And if your doctor wasn't sure, that'd be a time when you say, mm, can you send me to a dermatologist or a specialist who's gonna know what to look for or what tests to do? Because sometimes I can, in two minutes in my office, I can scrape it, say, wait right here, go into the microscope. I use my little special stain called Swartz Lambkin stain, and I can look. And if there is fungus, if it is ringworm infection, I'm gonna come back at the room and say, we got it, it's fungus, we're gonna treat it totally differently. But if it's clear, uh, then I'm gonna say, okay, we're gonna go the other direction. Next slide, please. So that brings us to our next type of eczema, a very common one, I treat this a lot, called dishydrotic. And dishydrotic is, uh, gets its name because uh, hydrosis, hydro means water, or in this case, sweat. And one of the theories early on was that this has to do with increased sweating or some problem with the little sweat glands uh, in, our, in our skin. It turns out it's probably not true. It's, it's really more of, again, just an eczema, it's inflammation. But the characteristic of dishydrotic eczema, sometimes you'll hear it referred to as pomphalus, um, is that you get little itchy blisters, usually on the sides of the fingers, but it can be anywhere, palms, and also on the feet, of course. Uh, and it's often terribly itchy and, and to be very, very tough to treat. Next slide, please. So little blisters, we see tiny deep-seated ones. Some people say they look like little tapioca beads. Um, and so it's, it's a real tough one for a lot of patients. These are super itchy, sometimes even painful. When it affects the hands, it can really affect quality of life. A lot of my patients who work in healthcare, this is a huge problem. They're washing their hands, they're using alcohol, sanitizer, and then they get their dyshydrosis and it's terrible, it's really terrible. Um, so again, we have to think about what else could this be. Sometimes I'm pretty sure, especially if they've had a long history of it, I say, okay, I'm pretty confident. But sometimes if it's brand new, you say, okay, are we sure this isn't an id reaction? We're gonna talk about that in a minute. That's sort of uh, almost like a, a sympathy reaction from some other focus of inflammation in the body. Are we sure this isn't fungus? Because again, tinea or fungal infections on the hands look very different than ringworm, where around the body you get that ring shape. Uh, we know on the scalp it often becomes a boggy mass, but on the hands it can just become scaling redness and little blisters. So you have to be sure, and again, all those same caveats are, if you start putting a strong cortisone on the wrong thing, uh oh, that's not what we want to do. Scabies is another thing. So scabies it is uh, an infestation caused by a tiny mite that gets into our skin, burrows little tiny holes, lays eggs, and makes us incredibly itchy. Scabies is important because it's totally curable. People kind of get freaked out about it, but it's one of the best diagnoses because I can get you 100% clear and you're just you're done after we get you better. You don't need me. We just clear the infestation. But if you don't know what it is, sometimes people will have it going on for a while before it all is figured out. Uh, viral infections like hand, foot, and mouth can look very much like this too. So out of contact, somebody first time they have these blisters, you might say, hmm, this looks more like a viral uh, in infection. And then even things like pustular psoriasis. So there's a lot. And um, you know, people make fun of dermatology. We're just pimple poppers or we put steroid on everything, right? We hear people complain about that, but it's not true, right? We see here, this is an example of you couldn't put steroids on most of these things, actually. So you kind of have to know. And if you don't know, we want to do tests to find out. And in general, generally in skin, the main test we're going to do if we're not sure was going to be a skin, a skin scraping to check for bacteria or fungus or a skin biopsy. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of blood tests that we can do. And sometimes my patients are frustrated. They'll say, can't you do some blood work? I mean, show me what it is. And I wish we could. It'd be amazing if we had a blood test just to say, yep, that's dishydrotic eczema but we, we don't know what that test would be. So sometimes I'll tease them. I'll say, sure, well, what test should we do? And they give me a dirty look. You know, you're supposed to know. I say, I don't have it. I wish I did, but I can do other tests. Next slide, please. Before we move on, you said that um, with some of these, you should not put steroids on other than obviously it won't get rid of it. What, what would somebody look for? Let's say they went to a different doctor, got an incorrect diagnosis and they put the steroid on, what would happen? Well, doctors never make mistakes, so that could never happen, right? No, I'm kidding. We make mistakes all the time. <laughs> those people so we have to work together we want to come from a place of love and try to help each other and uh, we try never to be too arrogant because I get I get schooled every day by the skin every single day I've been doing it for a while and I still get schooled every single day so anybody who's not humble we got to be a little bit careful of because they they don't know what they don't know 
right? That's my new favorite idea. You don't know what you don't know sometimes. So, uh, but the things would be bad to put uh, steroids on would be a fungal infection, a bacterial infection, uh, except for that case where we have both, then you can kind of do a twofer, put two things on at once. Scabies, you should not be putting steroids on. Uh, you have to get rid of the scabies. We have special antiscabatic medicine, permethrin cream is the main thing we use. Um, the viral infections, it probably wouldn't do much for, it wouldn't necessarily hurt. Uh, and uh, we have one I didn't mention, but herpes infection, cold sore, same thing. We would not want to put steroid on that. So what would happen though, if you did put steroid on? Basically, the steroids are going to suppress the local immune response and potentially make it worse. So with, with the fungal infection, it could then get much worse. It drives it down deep. And we've seen this where people have been putting a steroid on and on and on on a ringworm infection. And so now what would have been easy to do with the cream, now it's gone deep, deep down because we've suppressed the local immune system. Now they have to take the pill uh, for antifungal treatment for a few weeks. Now that's not dangerous per se, but it puts a stress on their liver, it's more stuff, and it opens up the door for more trouble. We don't want that. We don't go looking for trouble, so we'd much rather get it easily. Great. Thank you. Uh, we're going to talk about id reactions in a minute, but some of the things that can trigger this are stress, seasonal changes, contact allergy, and weirdly enough, fungal infection somewhere else on the body. So a cl classical story is someone can have fungal infection of their feet, athlete's foot, right? And then they can get dyshydrotic eczema. So you kind of have to be uh, thinking about that because if the patient's wearing their shoes, you might not examine their feet if they say, no, it's just my hands. But sometimes I'll say, let me just check your feet too. And then they have really bad athlete's foot. We treat their athlete's foot, not with a steroid, with the athlete's foot cream, and then their hands are clear. So that's amazing. So that concept is not currently in favor, but in the 70s, it was the hot topic of dermatology. They call it occult infection. If you want to drive your doctors crazy, bring this up. Um, because it drives us crazy because it is hard. We wish we could find it all the time. And when you do, it's the most satisfying thing. You have a patient who's been struggling with hand dermatitis, dyshydrotic eczema, and you find their athlete's foot and you cure it, you feel you know, you feel like breakdancing. It's the best feeling in the world, but it's so rare. Most of the time, we're not that lucky. But uh, but if for a while, people thought maybe what if all the immune stuff we're seeing is caused by a secret hidden infection? And probably not the case, but sometimes it is. Next slide, please. <laughs> Uh, treatment's really tough, and uh, we, we do a lot of different things. Sometimes we can do soaks, uh, like there's a thing called Burrow Solution, or Dombro is kind of the brand. You can get it at the drugstore. It's been around forever. You can do these gentle soaks. That's a little bit astringent and helps. Uh, we use our strong, strong cortisones. One of the problems for hands and feet is people are you know, reasonably nervous about cortisones. They don't want to do too strong, but if you do weak, it just doesn't penetrate. So it's like you put on a low potency and just not doing for most patients it's just not enough so yeah because that skin is so thick you have to go a bit stronger even if it seems a little scary but as long as you're just using it on your hands and feet usually you're okay um, and then uh, sometimes really bad cases we have to put them on immunosuppression we have to do like we would do for severe atopic dermatitis Excellent. let's move on to seborrheic dermatitis and we can see the scaling and redness. This is um, commonly seen in areas where there's a lot of oil. So it likes the nasolabial fold. It likes by the brows. Uh, it likes the hairline. If you have hair, I don't have much. Um, it also does the mid-chest sometimes. The, it is probably related to a combination of genetics, hormones, and then there's a yeast, this little yeast called malassezia, and that yeast overgrows in these areas and seems to create this funny milieu where there's immune response and skin barrier, and it's, it's weird, but it's very common. Babies get it, and we get it a lot, and we call it cradle cap on the babies, or sometimes people very delightfully mispronounce it as cradle crap, which sometimes really summarizes it, but cradle cap, um, and then adults uh, can get it in those more characteristic areas as well. Next slide, please. It's definitely an eczema because it's got those eczematous features, but it's kind of different. And usually we try to minimize our steroids here, like we do always. We're always trying to minimize steroids for sure. But here it, we can actually maximize the anti-yeast treatments. So things like uh, ketoconazole shampoo can really help and some of the uh, other types of anti-yeast shampoos like selenium sulfide uh, can all help. So we can do those on the scalp and the body uh, for more severe cases where there is a lot of inflammation, we'll pair that with a little bit of a cortisone. And for the face, we use something more mild, usually for the scalp, maybe a little stronger depending on how bad it is. 
And then again, just like atopic dermatitis, we can try to get non-cortisones on board as soon as we can. So that could be the tacrolimus, pimacrolimus, or the chrysoboral, those non-steroidals that we have. Next slide, please. Asteatotic eczema. Uh, it has another name, a more exotic and exciting name, eczema crackle. And this is fascinating because this happens more in adults than in kids. Very dry skin. It looks like um, like the like our dried out riverbed, cracked riverbed. It's like dry and, and these big big scales in between. Um, sometimes we'll see this on the backs of the hands from washing too much too. People will get these big cracked areas um, and it's uh, it's tough but it's usually fairly easy to treat. Next slide please. So this is great. That's a great picture of it. Thank you. Kind of it looks kind of like ichthyosis when we see it. So the cracked riverbed kind of pattern um, and it can be uncomfortably itchy too. Next slide please. So how do we treat it? If you can humidify the environment, that helps. Uh, we want to use gentle cleansers. We want to use um, good moisturizers. That's really the secret. So we just want to do something maybe a little lighter weight during the, during the day. And it's one of my favorite tricks is to put an oil on first. So my favorites are coconut or sunflower seed oil. Put that on first when the skin is damp and then seal it in with a heavier moisturizer. And then maybe at night, a really thick, heavy moisturizer, something that's more waxy. Um, or petroleum based. You know, we have some of the different options in that, in that category now. We have ones that have dimethicone that are more of a plasticizer almost and they protect or, or a petroleum based. Both are great in that role. Next slide, please. Now, we talked about this earlier, this id reaction. This is such a cool concept. This is a picture of it. So kind of a widespread, often little juicy bumps all over the body. If we go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. It, its other name is an auto eczematization uh, or auto sensitization and it gets called id reaction. Id is a Greek suffix and it means the son or the daughter of. So the idea here is that there is a infection or a source of inflammation somewhere in the body and I'll give you a classic example. It's a patient has tinea capitis ringworm and they usually have what's called a carry-on where it gets soft and boggy and kind of sometimes even infected with bacteria. So they have a true super infection, bacterial infection on top of their fungal infection. It's a mess. The immune system goes crazy at this. It's just trying to fight it. It's flipping out because it cannot beat this bacteria and fungal combo. There's tons of inflammation in the area. And then it sort of trips this switch where you get this aid reaction or I like the other term for it, a sympathy reaction. So you start getting this itchy, juicy bumps all over your body. And if you don't know about what's going on with the scalp or the foot or some other area of the body, then you're confused. You're like, are you allergic to something? Are you reacting to something? But, um, but once you figure it out, you say, well, you, yes, you kind of are. You're allergic to that infection somewhere in your body. And this is the sympathy reaction slide please. Um, so yeah, so these are where we can see it, including one of the other things we can see it in is stasis dermatitis in adults, which I think we're going to talk about in a few slides as well. We'll go to the next slide. Um, we talked about the carry-on or nickel is a common one. Nickel allergy people are allergic to their belt buckle or their jeans, so they get the patch on their belly and then it goes everywhere. And this is maybe a little too, we'll, we'll push through this one, kind of the, the theory of it, we don't really know. Um, good, and so for treatment of the, of the um, id reaction, we want to try to find what's driving it when we can. So if we find the fungal infection, we want to treat that. If we find the allergic contact dermatitis, we want to treat that, get the nickel out of, off the skin and, and cool the skin down, and then it will go away. It's kind of interesting. That moves us to pityriasis alba. This is a really important one because this gives a lot of concern. People are worried about this. So the key hallmark of pityriasis alba is you get these light spots, usually on the face, but also chest, upper arms. It's usually kids around six to 14 years of age. They sometimes are scaly as well. They get tons of misdiagnosis. People say, oh, it's just the ringworm or it's tinea versicolor or it's whatever. A lot of times people think it's from the medicine. I think the cortisone's bleaching my skin, but it really does seem to be its own separate piece. And the way we like to think of it is it's kind of a low-grade inflammatory dermatitis, kind of a low-grade eczema because it's usually seen in kids with atopic dermatitis. And the pigment cells kind of quiet down and they 
stop producing as much. So if you get, especially if you get a little sunlight, then the skin around tans just a little bit, but that area where the pigment cells are under, under attack and don't wanna make any pigment, you see this contrast, so you get kind of a light area. Next slide, please. And this picture is maybe not the best, but um, this, this baby, it looks like she has a little patch of eczema on her face, but it certainly could become pyrrhosis alba. It would be kind of a light mark. So what happens when you try to search for pictures? No worries. Of all these eczemas, it's always a challenge, as I'm sure our but no, community it's my bad. knows. <laughs> But basically little white patches. What people really get worried about is they get worried about vitiligo. And so we try to caution them. Now what we do to um, tell you it's not vitiligo, ah, someone took it, but I have my special lamp over here. We have a thing called a woods lamp and we can actually shine it on the skin and we know if there is complete lack of pigment, which we see in vitiligo. It's depigmented, all the color is gone, or if it's just low pigment, hypopigmentation, which is what we'd see here. So we can make that diagnosis really confidently within just a couple seconds with the right tool. Uh, when we know that that's all it is, we can breathe a sigh of relief because vitiligo is that autoimmune one where it really is damaging the pigment cells. And um, that's, that can be much more worrisome and we have to treat that a little bit differently. But with P. alba, we can use a gentle cortisone uh, or even just good moisturizer. A little bit of sunlight does tend to be helpful. Uh, and then it takes some time. We just, we just have to be patient and we'll come back. Let's talk about stasis dermatitis. Um, I think we mentioned this a little bit ago. Stasis dermatitis is one of the things that can trigger an id reaction. And this is almost exclusively in adults, uh, rarely seen in kids. And the idea with stasis is that patients that have problems with circulation in their lower legs, uh, particularly people that have had, um, if they've had vein surgery or if they've had a blood clot in the past, and then definitely people that have heart failure, even a little bit of heart failure. Many people are healthy, but their heart's not quite being efficient, so it's called heart failure, even though the heart's still working and hasn't totally failed. Um, kidney failure as well. When they get swelling down there, this is a reaction to that swelling in the legs, and the legs become uh, beyond swollen. They get erythematous red, hot, tender sometimes, it can actually look like an infection. And one of the problems is that if it looks like an infection and someone doesn't know, they go to the emergency department. And many times the emergency department doctors are, they don't know, and they say, gosh, this could be an infection. So they put the poor patient on IV antibiotics uh, and sometimes hospitalize them. And I had a patient who was hospitalized 13 times in two years for possible, they thought it was infection, they called it cellulitis, but it was just stasis dermatitis. So once she got in, we were able to get her a plan that was very similar, would be familiar to everybody who's had atopic dermatitis. We put on our cortisones and we actually do a wet wrap. Basically, we use a thing called an Unaboot, uh, which some of my patients know because I, I put Unaboots on them for atopic derm as well, but we wrap that area and she never got admitted for the next five years, she was so happy. So I didn't have to go in the hospital, didn't need IV antibiotics, she it was great. <laughs> so those are some of the things we can do. Now, if it gets bad, it can actually open up um, and cause big sores. And so that can be a real problem. And then sometimes patients can have a true infection. So it's not always easy to know what's going on. And um, people make fun of dermatologists. They say, you never get called into the hospital and this an emergency. But true story, I've been called in several times in the middle of the night for stasis dermatitis because people say, gosh, is this a really bad scale? It looks terrible. It's swollen and red. It's all scaling on top. The patient's in a lot of discomfort. And they say, or should we be worried that this is a deep skin infection? Or sometimes even they're worried about flesh-eating bacteria, the, the name for that, necrotizing fasciitis. And uh, they want to know, do we have to admit this patient and call surgical service and get all this stuff? Or can we just send them home with the wet wrap? <laughs> can you imagine if you're that patient, you're, you're on the balance between being admitted, having surgery come in, all stuff, and then somebody comes in and says, no, you're okay. We're just going to wrap you and we'll see you in the morning. And they're all better. I mean, it's unbelievable. It's one of those times where you feel like you can make a big difference for somebody and save their night from being terrible. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit about lichen and how, how are we doing on time? Are we? We're good. We're mm -hmm. good. And how many, how many slides left do we have? Do you, do you know? Um, yes, we have, um, we have 10 more of topic. Okay. So about, about 10 minutes or 15? And some are just pictures. Okay. So I can, and then we'll have time for questions. So it'll yep. be good. 
Okay. Um, so lichen simplex chronicus is really interesting. Its other name is neurodermatitis. Uh, it is really a fascinating, um, it's a syndrome really. It's sort of a, it's a group of symptoms that come together. It can be seen in different situations, but we kind of know it by its predilection for certain areas. So the back of the neck is a common place, the ankles, the pretibial areas, the wrists, people kind of have favorite spots. It usually is uh, poorly demarcated, although sometimes it's, it's really crisp, you can see the borders, and sometimes it's many spots, other times just one or two. The skin gets that thickened, lichenified look, it gets dark, um, and it can be really uncomfortable because we know what's happening under the skin is the nerve endings are gigantic, they're huge, and they're sending the signal for itch all the time. There's also a big kind of a behavioral component. People get sort of used to it. It's almost like a, a mindless habit sort of thing. And many of my teenagers have this. If they even start getting a little stressed or they're doing their homework, they'll go to their spot, they'll dig their foot or they'll put foot over foot. This is a great picture of it. So the, maybe this is foot to foot, they kind of do a little rubbing or maybe they scratch at those little spots and it can be really uncomfortable for patients. And it's actually because it's so chronic, it's even in the name, it is tough to break the habit. You've got to get the skin better, you've got to break the habit, you've got to let everything heal. But I, I assure you, you can. If you have this, we really can help it. Now, what triggers it in the first place? We don't really know. Sometimes there is a traumatic event like a bug bite or people get a, uh, an allergic reaction to something in the area, but many times there's no good reason for it. Uh, we usually don't see it in little kids. It's more teenagers and adults, but it's definitely more common in patients with atopic dermatitis. Next slide. When we have this, the hardest part is kind of breaking the whole cycle of it because people often are doing it for years and years. So we will do a lot of the same things we do for atopic dermatitis. One of the things that I like a lot is to do one of the cortisone tapes. So there's a there's a tape, and it lo almost looks like a scotch tape or a medical tape, but it has the cortisone built in and you can just stick it on. It protects the area and pushes the medicine in. And I'll do that like every night for a couple of weeks and that can make a huge difference. Sometimes I'll even do little shots, tiny little intralesional shots, so just shots into the spot. It's pretty safe because we're not putting the cortisones really in your body. We're talking it's like a couple of drops so it gets it stays pretty much local and breaks down before it gets into your body or blood um, or we'll do things like wraps. I do a lot of Uni boots and wet wraps for this. Uh, one of the things that can be nice the over-the-counter menthol or camphor that can kind of be cooling and soothing for some patients. Now, uh, kind of in the same family is a very misunderstood condition and a very important one. It's pyrigo nodularis and uh, also called nodular pyrigo. This, this condition is, is a big deal. This affects a lot of patients and I, I often think this is one of my biggest areas of need. We need to help our patients who have this. These um, are multiple papules or nodules. Uh, so bumps all over the body. They usually affect the arms and the legs, but many patients have them kind of all over. Almost always though, they spare the face. So usually you're not gonna have to worry about the face, but the body can be affected. It does seem a little bit more common in patients of Asian heritage and in kids if they have lichen simplex chronicus, because they're kind of similar. Uh, where lichen simplex chronicus is a little bit more of an area, parigo is more spots. It is extremely itchy. Uh, many times they become crusted and open uh, because people are scratching at them sometimes totally inadvertently or in their sleep but oftentimes there really is like a focal point or a little bump that seems to trigger it so it's a real thing it's not a crazy condition one of the hardest parts for these patients is people keep telling them they're crazy now uh, next slide please if there is one on Prigo Okay, that's a good example of a parigo nodule. That's more of a superficial one. Some of the deeper ones have a lot more heft, but that's a good one. It's kind of scaly. And we see all the hair is broken around it too. So from probably from the scratching. Um, sometimes we think there could be a trigger like bug bites or scabies. I've had patients who've had scabies. They clear their scabies, but then their skin sort of was never quite the same. The little, presumably the little nerves are going crazy and they keep sending that itch signal and driving the poor patient crazy because they want to stop this. They want this to stop. There is a big overlap with two kind of closely related conditions. Um, one of them is called Morgellons, sometimes pronounced Morgellons. Um, and this is where people find little like threads uh, coming out of the skin or inside the wounds. It's a controversial disease because there have been some studies on it 
and nobody's quite sure what to make of it. Nobody's sure what to make of the threads. I usually think of it as a variant of Parigo. The other one that sometimes people get thrown into, sometimes when they don't even say these things, but there's the concept of delusions of parasitosis, which means a patient is convinced that he or she has parasites in their skin, uh, when by all conventional tests, they don't seem to have those. So first thing when someone says they think they have parasites is we check, we do scrapings, we do biopsies, I'll look at samples, I want to be sure that they, they don't, because if they do, again, that's usually a good thing, as weird as it sounds, it's good because we can usually treat it very easily. But many times they, they don't seem to have any parasites that we can find. And so they end up looking a lot like Prigonodularis. And so again, I think that is part of the variant. And I don't know if it's that there is the skin, the chronic itch and the discomfort from the skin is sort of driven some part of them a little bit crazy from this because it feels like there's something in there. Or sometimes I think there may be folks where they have this delusion, this thought that they have something and then they sort of bring about the lesion secondarily. There's probably a range. Um, if you've ever been itchy for any reason, if you've ever even thought you have bug bites on and you start feeling itchy, uh, you can drive yourself a little crazy. The, the, the damage to our quality of life and to our mental state is enormous, which is why we're here tonight. I mean, this is an important set of diseases that affects people tremendously. And my job and our job uh, for the NEA is to get people better. We want this to not be taking over your life. We want you to be able to get back to work, get back to school, have your life again. We got to get we got to get your skin under control. So there are some really new exciting thoughts about how to treat it because next slide, please. The trouble with this is we have very, very little ability to treat this. Now, when we have these patients, we do sometimes need to do a workup because if your liver is not working correctly or your kidneys are not working correctly, or uh, if you have a cancer uh, that's brewing, we want to try to make sure that that's not what's driving this itch. And so we'll sometimes do blood work, uh, we'll do chest x-ray, we'll talk to your primary doctor sometimes, I'll see if we want to make sure they have all of their cancer screening up to date. Usually, fortunately, if we don't find anything, I mean, Again, fortunately, unfortunately, patients sometimes say, please find something, give me a reason for this. But but also at the same time, we don't want to give you the reason that, that it's a cancer. Uh, we want to make sure it's nothing, but sometimes we will. And then the treatment is really tough, just like lichen simplex chronicus. And the truth is we have zero FDA approved medications for this condition. If you say, what is the, you know, what's approved for this? There's nothing. So everything we do is sort of by definition off label. And we do strong steroids, we'll do shots, we'll do wraps. Uh, there are some powerful, anti-itch medicines that we can give by mouth that can sometimes help but we really need something and, and there are a few companies right now it's really exciting working on different potential therapies for this condition so i'm in heaven because nobody's cared much about this up until now except a few of us who've really been interested in trying to help these patients and figure this out and now we have a couple of companies who are really putting energy and money and time into not only finding a treatment, but also understanding it better. And that's one of the coolest byproducts of when drug companies get interested in, in a condition, not only do they help us treat it, but they really help us learn about it. They help bring up awareness about it. And so we are really happy that companies are showing interest and in even making events like this possible because they want people to understand it better. They want people to who have it to, to come forward and start telling us about it because I think a lot of people with this in particular kind of sit quietly and feel like nobody can help them. Next slide, please. Juvenile plantar dermatosis, uh, sometimes called juvenile plantar dermatitis, is one of the hardest things I treat. It is really tough. It affects kids almost exclusively. I've actually never seen it in an adult. Um, it, it tends to improve at, at puberty. So it seems like it's kids who have sweaty feet that, that it affects most of the time. And then they get this kind of shiny red, uh, almost like psoriasis look to the feet. It can be itchy. It's usually not terribly itchy, but it can be in some patients, but the feet can crack and bleed and it's uncomfortable. And this is a great picture of it. This is a, a gorgeous photograph of it. Next slide, please. Um, so these painful fissures can affect sports. They can affect quality of life. They often affect those toes and um, it's really tough. It seems to affect kids more who are wearing like uh, sneakers or the, you know what the worst was um, when Crocs were first a big thing a few years ago all the kids were wearing Crocs with no socks and I, I love Crocs actually I'm a big fan uh, but when you wear it without socks your feet sweat and that that kind of plasticky material pushes that sweat against the foot so we saw a ton of it at that point I still see it though even in kids who don't so they I think there's something that can bring it out but they're not the whole story and the next slide 
we talk about treatment, one of the things is trying to keep that wetness away from the feet. So cotton socks, um, uh, replacing them a couple times a day even. I have some kids, I have them bring two extra pairs of socks or during the day, if they get even a little bit damp, they just change them. Um, weirdly enough, leather shoes seem to be better. I don't exactly know why that is or maybe some property of the leather than plastic type shoes. Um, we know that good moisturization helps. Sometimes you can use a cortisone if it's uncomfortable, but it just relieves a little bit of the discomfort. It doesn't really help the condition in my experience, uh, at least for most patients. There's always some that will say it helps. Sometimes we can use um, uh, protopic tacrolimus uh, as well, and that can help. But again, even that, this is just tough to treat. And that so brings I'm, us to the end. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Leo, for a very informative presentation. It's always nice to talk about the other ones. I know we get a lot of questions about it. And speaking of questions, that's what we are moving on to now, question and answer portion of the evening. Um, a lot of great questions have already come in, and we'll take the next two minutes to receive additional questions. So as I said when we first got started, go ahead and get those questions submitted through the webinar. While we wait, I would like to thank our sponsor again, Knixa, for their generous support that made this evening's webinar possible. And of course, we want to encourage you to get involved with the National Eczema Association and help raise awareness about these diseases. There are a lot of ways you can get involved. Um, you can become a NIA ambassador sharing your eczema journey in writing or in person, working in grassroots advocacy, joining our online support group on eczema-wise, and many other ways. Just uh, check out our website and you can always get involved there. You can attend events, as I mentioned before, October is Eczema Awareness Month, and we'll feature our virtual walk, Itching for a Cure, and also save the date for summer 2019 for Eczema Expo. And of course, you can donate as a 501c3 nonprofit, our work relies on the support of our community. All right, let's get started with some questions. So the first question, and um, this is a very new one. Uh, this person would like to know more about PLEVA, P-L-E-V-A, and PLC, the chronic version of that. Sure. Yeah. So, um, so PLEVA uh, stands for Pityriasis Lichenoides et Varioliformis Acuta. Uh, it is not an eczema, although it can be a little bit eczematous. It's on the differential, but it's not technically in the eczema group, but we can certainly talk about it. And it's kind of closely related cousin called PLC, Pityriasis Lichenoides Chronica. They are relatively rare. Almost no one outside of dermatology would know if you asked your primary doctor, very unlikely they would know offhand um, what these things are, but we do deal with them. They are part of the group of conditions called T-cell dyscrasias. The, the T-cells are acting abnormal and they are uh, a little bit beyond inflammation. They're slightly irregular. So they bridge the gap between inflammation and cancers. Uh, we know that there is a funny middle zone where the cells are acting abnormally, but they're not really malignant. They're not cancerous, but they're abnormal. So uh, Pleva in particular, it presents with these recurrent crops of big, juicy, red bumps that become necrotic. They have like a scab in the middle. It's pretty scary looking if you if you ever have a patient who has one. Um, uh, or if, you, if you've been a patient, uh, but it's pretty rare. So uh, in my career, I probably only had four or five patients with Pleva, uh, and that, that's about it. And they usually we bring them to grand rounds and everybody at the hospital sees them. Usually you can treat it though. There are different treatments we can do, but, um, uh, but it's a little tricky. And then PLC, I've had many patients. It's much more common, the, kind of the chronic version of it, if you will. Now, it's the lowest, lowest, lowest end of a cancerous thing. It's not really cancer, it's not dangerous, but I say that because it's not just an inflammation. The cells are a little bit abnormal. So for, for that condition, our, our general approach for PLC is to use either uh, a tetracycline antibiotic. So we'll use one of the antibiotics like minocycline or doxycycline. We use it because we think it has an immunomodulatory effect. It affects the immune system and helps it settle down. For many patients, you do that and they're better, which is awesome. Um, other patients, my, my preferred choice is light therapy. We'll do uh, narrow band ultraviolet B light therapy, and that has a very high rate of getting them totally clear and 
patients, they're great. Um, some poor patients will have recurrent episodes, though, particularly with pleva, they'll keep getting these, these crops of lesions, particularly if they get stressed or if they get an infection. But those are, those are interesting conditions for sure. Um, we have, I'll, I'll just read the direct question because there's a little background in it. Uh, my nine-year-old son has seasonal allergies. Recently, he has developed what we think is dyshydrotic eczema and starts on the fingers and eventually ends up on torso and legs. It can last over a month. Um, the ultimate question is, how do we control and avoid, which we talked a little bit about, and then best, te what is the best test? Skin scrape when actively found. Um, and particularly, they're noting that the note, they're curious about the connection with herpes because he has cold sores on his mouth at times as well. Um, and they're currently using 2% cortisone, which doesn't do much. That's great. There's a lot in that case. Um, I think uh, the first thing is there can be a connection with herpes. Herpes can be a trigger. So there are a couple of things. The, the most classic thing in the textbooks is what's called HAEM, herpes associated erythema multiforme. So people get a cold sore, it can be in their mouth or around their mouth or it can be anywhere on their body. And then they get this erythema multiforme, which again is not truly eczematous, but um, it's inflammatory. So you get these ring-like shapes all over in blisters. Uh, so that's the most common one, but definitely other viral triggers can bring out even dyshydrotic or other forms of eczema. So there may be a connection. So you want to, um, I would want to get a dermatologist who's seasoned and experienced to talk to them about that a little bit, because if that's the case, uh, there's an easy fix. If it is the cold sores that are triggering it, we can put someone on a very, uh, a very gentle medicine, the acyclovir or valacyclovir, which is the antiviral. They're very clean. They don't mess up our bacteria. They don't, they don't really bother our body. They kind of just pass through, but the virus can't can't multiply when it's present. So by suppressing the virus, that would be an interesting way to do what's called a diagnosis ex juventibus. You treat it, and if that worked, then you say, my golly, because we know all we did was we blocked the herpes, this was what was driving it. Then that would fit with the id, the id type story. So the herpes is the primary infection, and then we're getting this dyshydrotic eczematous dermatitis. So a good seasoned dermatologist can help you kind of shepherd through that. What tests can you do? Well, if you've already tested to know that it truly is cold sore virus, herpes virus, that's the big test. The other stuff, probably nothing's going to be specific enough to help us. So really, we're going to need experience to look at the pattern, because if you biopsy it or scraped it, it's probably just going to show one of these eczemas. You know, it, it's not very good at distinguishing. Um, and it doesn't sound like it would be a fungal or bacterial infection. So probably we just need more of a seasoned person to shepherd you through it now. Great. Is seborrheic dermatitis the same as seborrheic keratosis? Oh, good, good question. No, they're quite different, even though they have the same first part of the name. The seborrheic keratosis are those brown, waxy, stuck-on bumps. You see them usually in older people, but they can start even in the 20s and 30s, or even teenagers sometimes. They kind of brownish, waxy things on people. Um, so those are totally benign. They're genetic. Um, they're just, we call them barnacles or wisdom spots, and they're harmless. Seborrheic dermatitis is the thing we talked about, the erythema, the redness, the scaling, the flaking, that has to do with that malassezia yeast. All right. Um, this is an important question. You touched on it, but I suspect a, a deeper discussion is probably uh, good. This person is saying they have a two-year-old daughter. Um, her eczema is always present. It presents differently depending on where on her body it is. And is it possible to have different types at the same time? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So um, it's one of the most interesting things about it that you have different presentations in the same patient over time, uh, different presentations on the same patient at the same time. It's, it's just, it makes it so weird and so interesting to me because you have to you have to be kind of flexible to diagnose it sometimes, and it can be very confusing to see different types of, of morphologies in the same patient, but absolutely. So in particular, uh, numular eczema is one that does it a lot of times with more classical eczema, and same with, uh, well, we, we didn't talk about it here because it's more of just a descriptor. I don't think if it's its own thing, but follicular eczema, where you get lots of fine red bumps all over. It's like every follicle, usually you see it on the belly, every follicle is sort of sort of red and elevated, and it has almost a little bit like a sandpaper feel uh, to it, which is kind of interesting. So absolutely, it's not common, but we see that, you know, not uncommonly either. You know, definitely have group of patients have multiple types. 
So it could be one type of eczema presenting in different ways, or it could in fact be different types of eczema all at the same time. Exactly. And it could be that there's more of an it, you know, we would want to we want to meet the patient and kind of learn a little bit more about it, but it could be uh, there's an id type thing. One type of eczema triggers a second type. It could just be that it's all the same. It just it looks different on different parts of the body, or it could be that there's two different diagnoses that some other issue is starting first. You know, you know, for example, the cold sore story, or if there is a ringworm somewhere, and then you're getting the secondary stuff. So it, it can be tricky. So that's why well, again, once someone really seasoned, who can say, okay, this is what I think is happening here. Uh -huh. What can you tell us about, I'm going to try to pronounce this, perioral dermatitis? Perioral dermatitis, sometimes uh, called periorificial, so because it's around the orifices or openings of the face, around the eyes, nose, and mouth, is another really tough one, and it uh, affects mostly adult women and then kids. Those are the two groups. So guys are just out of it. Adult guys are lucky. They don't have to deal with it. For the most part, it can happen, but it's it's much rarer. You get little tiny papules, micro papules. They're very, we call monomorphic. They're all kind of look the same. They tend to be around the mouth, around the nose, around the eye. You can have secondary eczematous change too. Uh, and so it can look almost like irritation. And if you're not paying close attention or not used to it, people will say, oh, it's a little irritation around your mouth. Here's some steroid. This is another condition. No way, Jose. You do not want to put steroid on it. Why? Because it gets better at first. It looks like it's gone. And then when you stop, it goes crazy. And it turns out the steroids are feeding it. So we definitely do not want to use steroids in this condition at all costs. Um, and people do, but we don't want to because it's, it's not good for them. And sometimes uh, we'll see it from kids who are using an asthma inhaler. So they are doing an asthma treatment with their mask. Well, of course, that sprays all the the steroid on their face and then they get terrible periorificial dermatitis, periodermatitis. It is not a true eczema. And as we've said, it's a little bit different, but uh, I think of it as a variation of rosacea. And so that's actually how we treat it. We use rosacea type creams, ivermectin, metronidazole, sulfur washes, things like that. And if it's real bad, we use a tetracycline antibiotic, which again, we're not killing bacteria here, but it has a powerful immunomodulatory and anti-inflammatory effect. And that usually does, we have to make sure they're not putting steroids on their face because I've had these cases who won't get better. And then they say, well, I'm just putting on this moisturizer and I look and it's Mobetazone or something. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's not a moisturizer, that's a steroid. And that's why you're feeding it over and over. Hmm. Um, what are your moisturizing cream or lotion recommendations for people with AD plus another type of eczema, such as dyshydrotic dis or aseatotic? It's really the same. Um, for those who know me, they know I am a moisturizer nerd. I love moisturizers. I could talk about it all day, um, but there's, there's so many good ones. So I want the best moisturizer is the one you'll use. That's key. So um, I think we want to try to find one that you like from, you know, in general, uh, there's so many great big brands out there that are all awesome. You know, you can look at the CeraVe brand, the Cetaphil brand, the Aveeno brand, you can Gold Bond, Theraplex. Um, you could do the fancy French brands, you know, La Roche-Posay and Aven. They're awesome. Use, I didn't mention Userin, Userin, Aquaphor, all of these. There's so many great ones. And a lot of it is finding something you really like. So for the day, I'll often pick something lighter weight, not a lotion that we don't want lotions because they're too watery. So a cream, but non-greasy. And some of the, you know, pretty much every brand we said has some cream-based ones that are great. So they're not going to be too greasy, especially for your hands. And then at night, you might pick something heavier, more protective. So maybe at night you'll use your Aquaphor, your CeraVe healing ointment, your Theraplex balm, you know, the really heavy ones. Those are great for the nighttime that will seal everything in. But during the day, the lighter weight ones are best, I think, for many patients. Some patients like ointment and greasy, heavy stuff all the time. And that's fine too. I think if I could pick, I would have people aim towards heavier when they can, because for most patients it helps, but there's no doubt I have some patients saying, oh, my skin doesn't like it. When I put on heavy stuff, it feels hot and uncomfortable. And that's really why your skin, you know, you want to listen to your skin and your skin knows better than I, than I know. So I like to try a few things and I like people to experiment a little and find stuff that feels good. Now, there are some things off limits. We said lotions are not so good. So anything in a pump, 
we're not so keen on um, as a general rule. And we definitely don't want things like fragrance. We don't want it packed with preservatives. We don't want a lot of plant stuff in there too. You know I love plants. For those who know me, I want to use botanicals that are healthy, but I also don't need a 42 ingredients of all sorts of plant stuff because if you get allergic to even one of those, now you're irritating and making the problem worse. So I actually like my moisturizers a little simpler. And if we want to do cool botanicals, I like to make that a separate step because then we can add and subtract that as we need. Great. How dangerous is it to use cortisone cream on my eyelids? It's it's not that dangerous. Sometimes, you know, a pharmacist will scare the pants off a patient and say, don't put this on your eye. You know, it's, it's gonna, I don't know what they're expecting to happen, but it's really not that dangerous when used correctly for short intervals under supervision. It would be dangerous if you used a really high potency one or even a medium or low potency one for a long time without checking in with anybody. What could happen? Well, there are a couple things. First of all, the eyelid skin is really thin, so your absorption is quite high, so you're absorbing a lot more than you would in other parts of your body. The big issue with absorption in that area, one, it could damage the skin, it could thin out the skin, give you stretch marks and make it look strange. That's bad, it's not terrible, terrible, but it's we don't want that to happen. But what's much worse is that because the eye is nearby, you have an increased risk of cataracts, where it gets hazy and covered, the lens gets covered, or glaucoma, the pressure increase, which can permanently damage your eyes. So around the eyes, we're particularly careful. Ideally, a good rule of thumb is we wanna stay low to medium potency at most around the eye um, at most. And we wanna do it, my, my favorite way to do it is a couple days. Can you do it for a few days, get it better, and then put it away. Now, then you can use a non-steroidal, tacrolimus, pimacrolimus, chrysoboral, those are fine. Uh, or ideally, if you don't need another medicine, a good moisturizer And there, Lotions in particular are terrible. Things that are lightweight will often sting and burn because that skin's so delicate. There's something heavy and thick and protective would be awesome. And it's really nice. You can put something really thick, protect those lids. Many patients say, gosh, doc, I only needed two, three days of the steroid. I put it away. Now I'm great. My moisturization's working. What if it's chronic? What if it keeps happening? Then we got to say, well, there, this is a very suspicious place for contact dermatitis. So that's a patient I would say, we got to do the patch testing to figure out, is there something driving this so we can remove it from your products or your environment so you don't keep having this? Hmm. Good to know. With numular eczema, should staph be treated continuously along with using steroids? Um, I think yes because it should be just a short time. So I, my favorite way to treat it, and this is, I would, I'll just flag it, it's controversial. Another dermatologist here might have a different opinion. But my opinion is on this, I like to do both. So this is a situation where I might do a mid to high potency steroid plus the mupirocin together and have people mix them together very much like the Dr. Aaron regime you know, that a lot of our listeners know about or have heard about. It's a very similar concept. And here we're killing the staff and cooling the inflammation at the same time. And usually within, seven to 10 days, 14 days at the outset, it's better. So I, I personally, again, this is my opinion, I like them often, I don't want chronic steroid use. So once they're better, done. And with numeral eczema, if we've treated it sufficiently, that usually works. They say, I'm great now, I don't need to do anything but, but uh, my moisturizer now. Do you advise when you have a numular presentation to uh, check for staff, do a skin scrape or something? It's a good question. So I don't because I expect it to be positive and it's it's positive in so many cases that I feel it's just extra expense for the healthcare system and it really doesn't change what I do. But if somebody didn't normally use mupirocin and this might affect them, then by all means, you know, someone who doesn't think there might be, I mean, you can test it. But for me, I basically assume my more moderate and severe patients have it because uh, most eczema does when you have the skin barrier broken, the staph is there. So I feel like it just wastes time and energy. But if a patient wants me to, I certainly will. Um, and sometimes the other doctors on the team feel great about this. Yeah, yeah, you were right. You're right. Now we really see it. Um, you know, that's fine if that's what they need. But I just hate that cost and time. Great. And... This is our last question. We're gonna shut it down for the night. Is it possible to get the plantar type, um, the juvenile plantar dermatosis, on the backs of the knees and necks of infants? My six month old excessively sweats all the time and he keeps getting this wet, sweaty type of inflammation. Interesting. Not to my knowledge. I've never seen it affect those areas. And usually it's not infants. It's, it's usually like the 
five, six, seven year olds starting in that range until puberty. So my sense is something different. I'm just trying to think, what could it be? Could this be more of a yeast problem when they have a lot of sweating? When the babies get a lot of sweat, they often have a yeast overgrowth and it can look shiny and pink. So I wonder if this is more of a yeast thing or very rare, but, but I had a case today, uh, infantile psoriasis. When babies get psoriasis, it looks quite different. It often affects the diaper area, but it can affect folds as well. And it can have that shiny pink look. It looks different than atopic dermatitis. And it's one that's rare enough that even most pediatricians, they don't they don't know what it is. I mean, it's. I mean, I only see probably a handful of cases per year of, of infantile psoriasis. And so even for me, it's kind of exotic. I saw a case today and I, it was great. The family was happy. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you again so much. We're going to